this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, Erin Hartman. Erin um, is a marine ecologist with an emphasis on coral reproduction and the effects of environmental change on stony coral recruitment. His field research sites have included Maui um, to the Caribbean and the Philippines. In his research, Erin addresses fundamental questions and generates actionable conservation advice for reef managers. Erin spent the last three years as a postdoctoral research at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in DC and San Diego State University. Um, he is now a visiting fellow in conservation biology at Harvard University. At Harvard, Erin plans to better define the critical habitat necessary for coral recruitment and map the distribution of these habitats throughout the reefs in the Pacific. Tonight, um, he will be discussing the earliest life stages of coral from fertilization to larval settlement and highlight new research examining how coral off offspring responds to the variety of environments they experience as they disperse in the water column. So basically, we'll be talking about coral babies. Without further delay, please help me provide a warm welcome to Erin Hartman. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Out there, we're doing well. Thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm honored by the turnout and I'm honored to be back here at the Maui Ocean Center. I um, was here in 2009 and did some rice coral spawning stuff. Um, and it was sort of one of my first forays into coral reproduction. Wasn't all that successful. And I'm happy to say I've come back with more success. And I'll uh, tell you some of those stories here today about what we're learning. And um, by far one of my most favorite and I think exciting topics in science. Um, as Lily mentioned, just by way of introduction, I did my PhD at Scripps Oceanography in UCSD, which brought me to the Caribbean and out here to Maui. And then I was at Smithsonian Natural History Museum. We're trying to understand the vast biodiversity of coral reefs down from, big, from the largest megafauna to um, viruses and even molecules. Um, and now at Harvard, I'm trying to bring those two together using genetics to look at um, the potential for new recruitment of corals throughout the Pacific. Um, and how corals may recover or continue to decline in different areas. So kind of starting at the most fundamental, corals are of course an animal, but they're an animal, plant, and rock all in one. So they're technically a cnidarian, um, but they harbor symbiotic dinoflagellates. So these are tiny algae that live in the coral, they photosynthesize, they release sugars and lipids to the coral, and that's what the coral survives on. Um, for the most part, 70 to 100% of its energy is coming from those symbionts. So it's sort of acting like a plant. It needs that bright light that it's getting in the tropics. Um, they also build a calcium carbonate skeleton. And what's really amazing, I think, about a lot of the corals out there is they just continue to build and grow and grow and grow somewhat infinitely. And so as a result of that, when you have all these corals building up a reef, they're actually building things that can kind of act like a massive break wall and even building islands um, that become atolls and whatnot. Um, so what these animals can do, in my mind, is, is quite incredible. Um, coral reef ecosystems also have a lot of value. It's estimated about $1 trillion a year come from coral reefs. Um, they're biologically diverse. They only cover about 0.1% of the surface of the earth, um, of the ocean, I should say. But about 25% of the species in the ocean live on coral reefs. And it's been estimated that as many as 50% of the species that live in the oceans are on a coral reef at some point. So they might go to a reef to reproduce and then go off into the ocean. But it's pretty staggering to think that half of the life in the ocean originates from something that's just 0.1% of the ocean surface. Um, they also provide what we consider to be ecosystem services. So this is kind of a lot of where the value that I mentioned comes from. Um, so they protect shorelines by building up those calcium carbonate skeletons. They provide food and medicine, um, often in impoverished countries, and they're great sources of tourism, um, bringing in tourists to see the reefs. As many people here, I'm sure, know, coral reefs are declining worldwide. Um, so eutrophication, or the runoff of nutrients and other pollutions, are harmful to reefs. Um, overfishing is also harmful because you're taking away um, a natural component and so uh, in particular, the natural lawnmowers of the reef. 
So herbivorous fish that are eating the algae are important because they're helping to make space for corals. Um, and also global change, climate change, um, and mass coral bleaching. Um, mass coral bleaching, for those of you who don't know, is when seawater is typically when seawater is warm, the corals and their algal symbionts are no longer friends. Um, the corals are being harmed by their symbionts and they kick them out or ingest them um, to get rid of that harm, but as a result, they no longer have their source of food. And as a result, if they don't get their symbionts back when waters cool back down, they die. And so as a result of that, you get massive die-offs like you might have heard, in particular in the Great Barrier Reef in the last two years, there have been major bleaching events. So these are all sort of major threats to corals and why they're declining so precipitously. So this combination of stressors <coughs> is turning many reefs that may look like this into reefs that look like this. A lot of the fuzz you see on there is different types of algae that have grown over dead corals or overgrown live corals. Um, and so the big question, of course, is can corals and coral reefs rebound? Um, and so my particular area of interest in that is what's the role of reproduction and offspring in recovery, right? What is the role of new baby corals that may find their way onto this reef um, and try to make a home there? Um, what's the potential for that to actually turn a reef like this back into a reef like this? So first things first, when we're talking about coral reproduction, we need to talk about how, how it works. So what we're seeing down here is this is one um, coral colony. These are two coral colonies, but they have different ways of reproducing. So the one on the left here is a brooding coral. And so what it does is it internally fertilizes the egg with sperm and then releases this competent larva. So this baby coral or a larva into the water column. They're typically um, larger than broadcast spawners. So this larva is then going to move about in the water column, find a place to settle, settle, oops, sorry, settle, and then go through metamorphosis. So what you're seeing here, this guy right here is just essentially a blob of fat, soft tissue, ciliated, can swim around. This, on the other hand, is calcium carbonate. So you're, it's actually gone through a metamorphosis, stuck itself to the bottom, started to make calcium carbonate, started to build that skeleton. And so in contrast to that, broadcast spawning species release these bundles of egg and sperm into the water. Fertilization happens at the surface. Um, and so sperm and egg from this colony is mixing with sperm and egg from this colony at the sea surface. And then you get these fertilized larvae that then can swim around in the water column. They disperse some distance, find their way back down to the reef, and then settle um, and metamorphose. And so you can see that these are kind of two contrasting strategies. In general, fertilizing, fertilization and brooding species um, leads to shorter dispersal, as in shorter distances traveled whereas broadcast spawning may lead to larger distances traveled, it certainly leads to much greater vertical distance. In other words, movement to the surface, whereas these guys are probably not making it to the sea surface. Um, two additional characteristics that are important. These brooded larvae tend to be larger, and they tend to already contain those algal symbionts that they actually get from their parents that they'll need when they're an adult coral um, growing on the reef. In contrast, most of these broadcast spawning species, when they make these bundles filled with eggs and sperm, their eggs don't have the symbiodinium or the algal symbionts in them yet. They have to find them at some point um, during dispersal or once they've made it back to the reef. And so that point is going to be important in one of the stories I tell you later on. So for just talking broad stroke, the questions that I'm going to pose today and try to give you some answers on is if we're thinking about quantity and quality, are all coral parents the same and are all coral larvae the same? It's somewhat rhetorical. I'm sure you sitting there would say, of course, they're not all the same. But we're trying to tease out some of the factors that make them different and might make some of them survive better than others. So it's sort of weird to stick your acknowledgments into the middle of a talk. But I will do want to highlight the team that I work with because um, I'm going to highlight a lot of the work that I actually didn't lead up. Um, and when I do that, I'll mention who did it. But all this work that I'm talking about today was conducted primarily with three people um, who are involved with Seacor International, which is a coral reproduction um, organization, and the Karmabi Foundation, which is in Curaçao in the Southern Caribbean. And so the majority of the work I'm going to talk about today 
we did there. Um, these are Val Chamberlain, Kristen Marhaver, and Mark Vermeer. So these are my partners in crime with all of this work. And so this island of Curaçao, you can see, is way down here in the southern Caribbean. Um, and it's a nice location to study coral reefs because whereas most of the Caribbean has very low coral cover, so coral cover is about 17%, meaning 17% of the seafloor is covered in corals, whereas historically it was close to 50 or 60%. Um, but Curaçao is sort of a nice um, location where that's not true everywhere. So whereas you can see, you know, the island-wide is 23%, you've got 30% here, 12% here, 16% here by the city. But once you move to this eastern point of the island, you get 55% coral cover. So you actually have a very healthy coral reef there, and a coral reef that hasn't experienced these declines that we see at so many other reefs. And so rather than a number, these pictures illustrate, I think, way better um, what the reefs at East Point look like. And um, I've been there numerous times, and they're, they're quite beautiful um, for the world as far as coral reefs are concerned. And so they provide a nice case study for us to be able to study very healthy reefs close to very unhealthy <coughs> reefs. Um, and not surprisingly, this is East Point above water. So East Point is undeveloped, um, and currents come from the ocean and pass across in front of it. And so as a result of that, that's why we generally think it's so healthy, is it hasn't experienced all of these um, impacts from land and from overfishing. And if you need more examples of this, stony corals and coral and algae, both indicative of a healthy reef, are much higher at East Point relative to macro and turf algae, which are much higher at the degraded reefs. And so we ask this question of, does the amount of coral predict the number of larvae that each coral are, predict, are, are producing. And so what we found was actually interesting. We found this m multiplicative effect. We found that you have more corals, whenever you have more corals at a location, those corals that are there are actually producing more offspring. So the blue is, is East Point and the white is the degraded city. They're producing more offspring per unit of coral than those on the degraded reef. So you would think, oh, you have more corals and each one produces 10 larvae, then you add that up, you're gonna get more. But actually, like per individual coral, they're producing more offspring. And there are more corals that become parents. And so a nice way to kind of do away with the ugly graphs is to show this infographic that my collaborator Mark made, is you have more corals on a healthy reef compared to a degraded reef. More of those corals are parents, and each parent is making more babies. So as a result of that, you get way, way more offspring out of these coral. And so we actually found that in one species, you get 200 times more offspring for the same amount of reef that you have on a healthy reef as opposed to this degraded reef um, on the left here in Curacao. And so the take home from this is that even if you have a very small healthy reef, it might seem hard to kind of pull out the value of that when you know, swaths of the Great Barrier Reef are getting decimated. But I think what our, our data are suggesting and data from other groups is that you have these, when you have these tiny hotspots, they can actually be extremely important. Because an area like East Point that's producing all of these larvae, these larvae can then disperse to other reefs, like degraded ones that are near the town, and potentially start to land there and help to rehabilitate those reefs, or at least maintain them at the levels they're at now. Um, so we're making the argument that these hotspots are really important. And sort of as a testament to that, um, the Bloomberg Foundation, Tiffany Company, and others have started a, a I guess, a um, push called the 50 Reefs, and they're trying to save 50 of the world's best coral reefs or healthiest coral reefs. Um, and I think that that's more than just a marketing ploy. I think there's a lot of ecological value to taking that sort of a strategy. Um, so then you might be sitting there wondering, so how did these corals at East Point make more larvae? Um, and one big question we would ask sort of as ecologists is, were the parents making a trade-off? And what I mean by that is if you're making more larvae, do you make smaller larvae? Or if you're making more larvae, do you put less energy into them? Because you only have this finite amount of energy to put into reproducing to begin with. Well, what we found is we looked at energy content and size. And so what we see here is energy content and three species 
size, and three species. And the take home here is there's no difference across the board. So these parents weren't making any less healthy larvae, they were just making way more of them at East Point. And so that brings back the question again, how were they doing this? So what we found was that corals at East Point had more energy stored in them. So they were more robust, they were more healthy um, than the ones at the degraded reefs near town. And that's particularly important that their energy was stored as lipids because as I mentioned earlier, coral larvae are al almost entirely lipids. So we call them little blobs of fat because they're 70 to 99% lipids. And they're actually living off those lipids as they're swimming around in the water column. That provides them most of the energy they need uh, to move around. So to follow up on that though, we wanted to sort of ask this question of what makes a healthy coral baby? Um, does size matter? Does energy content matter? Um, so we asked sort of the most fundamental question we could, or the most, most simple I would say, do larger larvae have higher survival? So if parents start making big larvae, are they gonna survive better? Because one thing we noticed is you would sample a bunch of coral colonies and they would make just this amazing range of sizes. Some species you would see like a four times increase in size from one colony to another of their larvae. So you just get this amazing variation in larval size. And we said, well, does that matter? Do those big larvae tend to do better? So we did this experiment where we looked at one brooding species and one broadcast spawning species, if you can remember back to coral reproduction that I introed. Um, we then forced them to swim around in the water, and we did that by putting them in very clean water in these test tubes, made them swim around um, for a week to burn off a lot of that energy, kind of make them ready to go find a place to live on the reef. We then gave them um, tiles that smelled like reef, so it had crustus coral and algae, or CCA, the pink stuff you might see out on the reef. Corals like to set, settle on that stuff, and so we gave them that, got them to settle, saw how well they settled, and then we took these tiles and stuck them back out on the reef that the, um, their parents were collected from. And then we monitored that for 145 days to see how well they did. So this is going from being a soft tissue larva to a settler to now a settler out on the reef. Oh, okay, sorry, those slides are out of order. So the big take home here for this brooding species is if we're looking at the number of settlers that lived and we're looking across those 145 days, what you see is that after about a month, all of the individuals who were small as larvae died. So they all just sort of tanked and by day 80, none of them were alive. But you don't see that die off a month in in guys that started large. And actually by the end of that, we had about a quarter of them that were still alive. And this is sort of incredible because they've gone through this metamorphosis, right? So them being large was when there were a larva. They've now gone through a metamorphosis. They're living on the seafloor, but that still seems to matter. So being a large individual um, when you're born does help you survive. Um, and so to skip back, the other aspect that we did to this is we gave them different environments. So the data I just showed you was from Ambien, what they would experience out on the reef. Um, but we also exposed them to high temperatures and low salinities. And we did that as a way to stress them out a bit. So when they were swimming around in these test tubes, they were in wa water that was warmer than they're used to or salinity that was lower than they're used to. And we wanted to see like if we push them, do they do better if you're big? Like does being big make you tougher effectively? And so to cut to the chase, what we actually found is that being big doesn't actually help you buffer these harsh environments. In fact, in this spawner, while being large did help, harsh environments weren't harmful at all to them, whether they were large or whether they were small. And in this brooding coral, it was harmful to be in these environments, but being big, again, did not buffer that um, effect. And so we're sort of scratching our head, being big isn't better, but these brooded larvae are really big and we think of them as tough generally compared to the spawner, which is tiny, but this species doesn't seem to care what their environment was like when they're a larva, whereas this one seems to be very sensitive. So we wanted to then ask this question, why were these big brooded larvae wimpy and the small um, spawned larvae much tougher? And so 
you'll remember back, I told you this key point to the reproduction story that I mentioned earlier, which is that the brooded larvae tend to have their algal symbionts in them already. The spawned larvae tend to not by birth. And so we ask this question of, does having those symbionts hurt the coral larvae in the same way that it hurts the adults? You might remember back that I mentioned coral bleaching and sort of the failure of the symbiosis between coral and their algae. We wanted to ask, is there also this failure if larvae are swimming around in the water column with these symbionts? So what my um, colleague Val did is she took one species of a brooding coral that already had its algal symbionts when it was born. They separated into three groups. So larvae that had few symbionts, larvae that had some symbionts, and larvae that had lots. They did this by eye, and I'm sure it was extremely painful. They then confirmed it by squashing larvae under a microscope and then looking at them and counting the cells, and they found that their eyes are pretty awesome, and they had very clear separation in the number of symbionts in each. And so when they put these few, some, and lots of symbiont larvae into ambient temperatures, everybody did fine, didn't matter. But then when they put them into high temperatures, what they found is those with few symbionts did okay, those with some did worse, and those with lots of symbionts, almost none of them survived. So this suggests that parents, in addition to making big larvae that might do better, lar by putting more or fewer symbionts into their larvae, they actually can um, have some effect on the environments that their larvae can tolerate, which would be particularly important, right, because their larvae are going to be moving far away from the reef they live on, potentially reaching the sea surface. So if you're moving through all these different environments, it might be good to be tough to those environments. So it might actually be advantageous to not have symbionts or to have very few symbionts. Um, and so for people who are sort of familiar with coral ecology and, and just how corals work, might ask this question of, wait, aren't brooding corals tougher or weedy? So as I mentioned, these brooders that I've been calling now wimpy are actually, as adults, tend to be the corals that are more tolerant of marginal or harsh environments. So if you go out to a degraded reef, you tend to just see these brooders. They tend to be smaller, and they tend to just kind of tough it out. We actually see the opposite effect in their offspring. And so the main take home here is that, yes, the adult brooding corals might be um, relatively tough, but their larvae, in particular when they experience different environments, aren't necessarily t so tough because of some of the characteristics they carry, like having those algal symbionts. Um, and in particular, I made the point earlier that, they're, that the coral larvae are moving through the water column. And all these tests I've been showing you are experiencing conditions that are most extreme at the sea surface. So what I mean by that is high temperature, high lights, and sometimes low salinity are all things more likely to be experienced at the surface of the ocean. And as I mentioned, these brooded larvae tend to stay low and settle. Broadcasters have to get to the surface to be fertilized. So I then wanted to ask this question of, well, okay, then are brooding corals selectively making negatively buoyant larvae so they can avoid the sea surface, whereas the broadcasters have to force their egg and sperm to the surface so that you get this mixing of egg and sperm for fertilization. And so what this crazy looking thing on, an, on the right is, is each one of these circles represents a coral species. And um, it's color coded by those that either give their symbionts to their offspring or don't. So if it's a black circle, they give their symbionts to their offspring or they don't. And if it's white, they, uh, they do. I'm sorry, the reverse. If it's black, they do. If it's white, they don't. Um, and if they're a brooder or a spawner. And so we wanted to ask this question as across all of these species. Are species um, that pass on symbionts, do they make species, their larvae in such a way that they're going to stay low to the seafloor? Um, because again, the brooders don't need to reach the sea surface, right? They have internal fertilization. And so what we found actually is that brooders tend to have reduced lipid content in their offspring in a particular type of lipid um, that is, makes larvae positively buoyant. So I sort of told you two double negatives there. But they reduce the amount of lipid that would make their larvae swim to the surface. So they keep their larvae low. 
But then if you're a broadcaster, you're sort of stuck, right? So your, your egg and sperm has to make it up to the surface to fertilize, because fertilizing at the two-dimensional plane of the surface is way more effective than trying to fertilize in the three-dimensional plane of the water column. Um, so what do they do? Well, we actually found that they tend to make smaller babies. And what's cool about that is that smaller eggs, once fertilized, develop more rapidly. And so the reason that developing rapidly would be advantageous is once you develop and you can swim, you can swim down. And so the idea there is that these broadcasting corals that do give symbionts to their larvae, there aren't many, but there are some, tend to make small eggs potentially so that they can develop quicker and settle out, whereas the brooders just make their larvae stay low. Um, and this sort of has interesting implications for the future of corals with climate change, um, in particular in terms of symbiont transmission and dispersal distance. Um, in terms of symbiont transmission, species like the Montipras, like the rice corals that probably some of you are familiar with, a lot of them on the reefs here in Maui, they are a broadcast spawner who puts symbionts into their eggs. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of effect an ever-increasing ocean is gonna have on Montipara in terms of their potential to reproduce. Um, and in terms of dispersal distance, um, one of my favorite titles to a paper ever was um, Why Are Islands Farther Apart in the Tropics? And it has nothing to do with geography. It has everything to do with that quick reproductive rate. And what they're saying is that if you make eggs that are fertilized and they um, become mobile very quickly, they're not going to disperse as far. So they tend to stay where they are. And so as the ocean is getting warmer and warmer, it's probably going to tend to retain um, broadcasted larvae much closer to the reef they came from, which is sort of a concern if we want to think about you know, larvae dispersing larger distances to reseed reefs. Um, but I would say to be determined on those two, two factors. Um, and so I'm going to leave you with um, the final science story and then talk a bit about um, assisted reproduction stuff. But it's this final question, which actually kind of has a happy ending, which is what if parents live in sea surface-like or warmer temps all the time? So what if they're already experiencing these high temperatures? How do their larvae do? Well, going back to Curacao, there's a desal plant in Curacao um, that's been operational for a long time. There's a very large volume of warm water going onto the reef there. Um, there's also a well-developed coral reef, which seems paradoxical because we think they can't handle the water. <coughs> um, but it's been there for a while. This warm water comes out of this pool here and goes this way. And so we're able to say, study a reef right there and study a reef here. Um, and they're experiencing different temperatures to sort of show that the warm water outflow is hitting temps like 30 and 31, whereas the control is um, sites that's not in the warm water is closer to 29. Seems like very small differences, but those are very important differences when it comes to corals and their potential for bleaching. And so what my colleague Val did is she went out and collected larvae from the warm water outflow and from the control cooler site. She then took them into the lab and, experienced and um, exposed them to both of those temperatures. So the warm guys got warm water, like where they came from, and the, the cooler water. Those from the cooler water got the warm water and the water that they came from. And so what we found is if we're looking at just the ones that survived in that water, if you came from a parent who is in ambient water or in warm water, um, you did absolutely fine in ambient water. So if you came from hot water and went to cold water, you didn't care. Came from cold water, went to cold water, you also didn't care. But if you were, came from the cooler water and you were exposed to the warm water, you had 40% reduction in survival. So in other words, you couldn't really handle the heat. Um, but of course, not surprisingly, if you were a larva that was born from a parent in the warm water, you could. So you were actually primed and ready to survive in that warmer water. And perhaps more interestingly, Val looked at settlement. So looked at the ability of these corals to settle and metamorphose, um, which signals their potential to actually become um, a, a colony and a, a member of the population. And so what she found is that if you 
were came from a parent that was in ambient or warm water and you're put in ambient water, you had this relatively low settlement. Um, statistically, if you came from a parent in ambient water and you were put in warmer water, you actually had a um, similar settlement rate at least to this one. But most interestingly, if you came from warm water and you were put in warm water, you had a higher settlement rate than all the rest. And actually like a 50% settlement rate is pretty massive for these guys. So if they came from warm water, were put into warm water, they actually settled and were happy to live there. And so what do these results suggest to us? Well, so they suggest to us that warm water doesn't necessarily kill coral larvae. They just need some priming. Um, because some species actually can produce viable offspring in these water if they've been there long enough. So these parents are transmitting something that allows their larvae to survive under these warm conditions. The parents on these cooler reefs are not transmitting. Um, and so going back to the stories I told you earlier, you might ask, well, they make larvae with fewer algal symbionts. No, that's not the case. Are they more tolerant algal symbionts? In other words, are they types of algal symbionts that do better um, in warm waters because some algal symbionts are better than others? And the answer to that is also no. Um, they have the same types of algal symbionts, whether on the warm reef or on the cool reef. Um, and so the next question, of course, is genetics. Is there natural selection going on? Are there genes or there at least gene expression patterns that are leading to higher survival in these warm temperatures? Um, and Val is currently in the process of, of figuring that out, so to be determined. But it's sort of a cool and hopeful story that corals actually can sort of tough out some of these conditions. And so with that, I'm going to leave you today with a couple other things going on in the Caribbean that I think are cool, which is that there's successful rearing of the critical Acropora palmata corals um, from sexual reproduction. So going out on the reef, collecting sperm and eggs, um, doing fertilization in the lab, settling larvae out, throwing them out on the reef. Um, and just in the last couple of years, we've actually had um, a couple of these colonies. Oh, this is a massive slide. It'll bounce back. A couple of these colonies here, including this one that's four years old, have spawned. So this is a coral that was grown um, in a petri dish, literally, um, initially put back on the reef, stuck onto the reef here, um, and it survived, which is um, very exciting. And it also was reproducing, which is important because then it's adding its, its own genes to the gene pool. Um, and this isn't just true um, of what's going on at this one, in this one endangered species. Um, we've also been able to successfully rep reproduce another endangered species in the Caribbean, as well as some that are not endangered. Um, I think the tally that we've done at Carmabi now is up to about 13 different broadcast spawning corals. So it's a really exciting example of how we might actually be able to help these species out a lot by doing fertilization in the lab, which gets to much higher fertilization rates than you would out on the reef, settling these guys out, and then throwing them back out on the reef. Um, because what you're seeing here is actually what looks like two-thirds of a Mercedes-Benz symbol. So what this is, this is a coral that's grown on, grown on what essentially is a terracotta Mercedes-Benz symbol, and it's just covered the whole thing. And so what Val and her colleagues have done is they've <coughs> taken tens of thousands of coral larvae, let them settle out on these little Mercedes-Benz symbols, and then figured out that you can just go diving with a bag of them and just jam them into crevices and put them down places and then let them grow. So of course that's a much faster way to get hundreds of baby corals of these settlers out onto a reef as opposed to growing one up to two years old and then having to glue it to a reef which takes a lot of money, takes a lot of effort. But if we can take these babies, this one is not a couple weeks old, but if we can take one uh, like hundreds that are a couple weeks old, go on a dive and jam 30 of them out there into a place that they should likely be able to grow up. It's a much faster and sort of technically feasible and ramped up way to potentially reseed reefs artificially um, with these corals. So with that, getting back to sort of this, addition, this um, early question I asked, what's the role of reproduction and offspring in recovery? 
I would say there's a massive role. Um, and we're just sort of starting to figure out how we can take advantage of these characteristics of these corals, um, characteristics of the larvae and their ability to grow, and then give them a bit of a boost to try to get them back out on the reef so they can help repopulate um, other reefs and also give a boost to healthy reefs like East Point that are already there, already doing their thing, reproducing, allowing them to continue to help um, seed other reefs in the region. So with that, I'll again thank my team as well as um, many other collaborators I've worked with over the years. And thank you all for being here. I hope it's been insightful and um, I'd be happy to take any questions.